Hello art lovers, this is Gordy Grundy with ArtReportToday.com. We are back with part two of our Spotlight series and a focus on Artillery Magazine. Let us rejoin editor Tulsa Kinney, columnist Zach Smith, and arts writer Julie Schulte. I mean, and that's okay. I mean, that's like, you know, the hammer openings. There's many times at the openings I will not go in and look at the art. I, I just haven't. And I'm like, oh, I'll come another time. <laughs> so, uh, and I do. But, yeah, I mean, huh, that's kind of interesting. So, New York doesn't know how to party, Zach? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I would say that... Well, all the rooms are, all the, all the ceilings are lower, all the rooms are smaller, and, you know, it's harder to get, like, and, and the real estate in the center of town is more expensive. Like, New York knows how to party. It's just, it, it's always, like, part of this whole complicated angst cycle of being a New Yorker. It's like, oh, it's not winter anymore, and now we can have fun. It's like, in L.A., everyone looks at everyone and goes, the only reason you came here is, like, to follow your weird dreams, like... Otherwise, you would have you'd be living in San Francisco. Like you don't care about <laughs> yoga, so everyone knows that everyone in LA is like here to like have fun, and that that just like I think it it influences a lot of things like on a low kind of unconscious level. I think you didn't like you know. There's this line in Alice in Wonderland where the cat says like, "You wouldn't have come to Wonderland unless you were nuts like us," you know, <laughs> and it's right. like. People don't just go to L.A. or even, you know, as a professional, stay in L.A. and then go, like, make art because they're like, this is the most responsible thing to do. And I think that that informs everything about the, about the city's cultural life in a really, in a subtle way that, that means it, it's always a little bit different. Like, if you wanted to be responsible, you'd move to San Francisco, right? You'd start a green business, like, entirely green and yeah. you do yoga and and everyone here's like i kind of want to do yoga and i kind of want to be green but i kind of just want to have fun and therefore you live in la but you're like i'm not ready to completely give up on doing anything so i'm not in honolulu like i haven't yeah. moved, like completely right. to a tropical setting I, I i want all the benefits of a city but i still kind of want to be a lunatic and you know la is kind of like it collects a certain bandwidth of people yeah I mean, like you know, bandwidth. yeah, <laughs> and you do have to figure out how to afford living in L.A. also, no, right? The same goes for New York. Well, right, right. I mean, it used to not be, though. L.A. used to be kind of, but anyway. So, um, well, I think you, you do yeah. get some really cool collab spaces here because there are, there, L.A. has a wonderful, like, because the space issue in L.A. is very different than New York. Like, in New York, you have to move to the periphery and get a where to get a warehouse or a big right. gallery or get a, you know, get a, a studio space. Whereas in L.A., you can get a, you can get a studio-sized space with a few friends in the middle of town. Um, right. For, you right. know, if you split it properly. So that, that is, it's expensive, but it's not expensive if you... If you have like a scene and like the art world kind of depends on groups of five to 20 people who all just decide like, let's all be friends and support each other. Like that's kind of the first step in the art world. And art school is kind of a way to buy your way into that for a lot of people. But like yeah. you need that. You need places where people can just live and work and then they're all friends. Like that's actually kind of a unspoken absolute necessity of any city that becomes like the hip cool art city. You know, right, um, right. definitely happens in Europe. And the fact that, you know, you can, I mean, downtown LA was going up and up and up and up. And then, you know, got, uh, there were the riots and everything. And, you know, rent is actually still, you know, it's terrible, but you can get a warehouse space for a decent price and people mm -hmm. still come here. And that's going to, that's going to stay like that for at least five more years. And then it'll, okay. you know, who knows Good what to happens know. to Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Well, Tulsa, what's coming up with the next issue? What are you working on? Well, we've got our, you know, I always like the summer issue to be kind of breezy. Once we did a celebrity art issue, we'll do a travel issue. It's kind of one that I like to have breezy. So this time we're doing summer reading. 
perfect. So it's a lot of fun. I have a lot of things from like eye miniatures to miniature books to a filmmaker who just does films about people reading. I forgot his name. So I do like that it's kind of eclectic. And um, so it's kind of a fun. I like, you know, I like the summer issue to be fun. And then our September issue, kind of going back to uh, a more serious subject, climate change. Well, which that's no a one has uh, given a, a lot of pitches to, by the way. They had all this excitement about it. And then I guess people don't care now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> We do what we can for climate change. That's all. Yeah, you know. well, maybe they'll think different when, you know, L.A.'s on fire. But anyway. <laughs> well, uh, what's Zach and Julie working on? I don't know. Zach, like he said, just does it whatever he wants. And I've always never been disappointed. I don't think Julie came in this uh, issue, but I'm going to have to lean on her. <laughs> like I said, we have a, la a lunch date, so I'll yeah. be leaning on her. Well, well Zach, what are you going to decode? Uh, I was going to let Julie go first because, okay. you know, uh, uh, she sounds like a deeper thinker than I. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I um, uh, also, yeah. she just hasn't got a chance to talk. You know? um, I, well, I'm, she's, Tulsa's right. I, I didn't pitch this round, so I won't be in the upcoming issue. Um, you know, my... My full-time job, I'm in finals, so I had to I had a pass this time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I have some ideas. Um, but I, I think Zach, you're if you're in it, you should you should go. Um, I can always talk about yeah. my okay. my dream pieces. But Tulsa's also been very open with me too, which is also what I love. Is I'm I'm able to be uh, thoughtful and um, kind of come with one more piece about desire, <laughs> and she's she's open to that. Um, well, I, I am. Yeah, I, I mean, I love working with, uh, I mean, Zach, I'm sure you haven't even thought of it. I will have to remind Zach, like, oh, Zach, are you going to do a call? Oh, no, I, I know. I know. <laughs> I know exactly what I'm, I know exactly what I'm putting in. Um, oh, good. Because I, like, I did this piece during the pandemic, which was just like, I have this fantasy, and in the fantasy, I just go to a completely normal middle of the road museum and just uh -huh. lie in the sculpture garden. So, you know, like I don't even care if there's like a, you know, like a, a highway like 10 feet from me, and I don't care if like all the most normal sculpture garden sculptures are there. Like a figurative kind of surrealist guy with a cube for a head and like something that looks kind of mythological, but something's melting. Like I just want to like be in a museum like just the desire to be in that space that I've kind of taken for granted for so long was like, Oh my God, wouldn't that be great? You know? And so I have a friend who was like, Oh God, when the pandemic is over, we got to go to a museum. So that's my, like, I'm, we're going to go and I'm going to be like, okay, I haven't been, you know, I haven't been in a year to a space like this and just sort of take it in from that point of view of like suddenly appreciating all the things that we all kind of are bored with and take for granted about, about those spaces. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do it, well, feel it, write it, you know. Well, you also wrote quite eloquently about that. I think in the January issue of artillery. Well, that how you missed museums, I think, right? Well, it was yeah, just that more was, about appreciation. I thought, you know, yeah. just those little things that we love, we don't think about. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Washington, D.C., which is like the museums are all free. Like, so a thing to do when you're a kid or a teenager is you just get on the train, you go downtown, and there's a protest. There's always a protest. You do the protest, and then you go to the museums. And that was like a really normal weekend for us, um, you know. And oh. so I grew up completely taking... Like, like monolith American mega museums for, for granted, you know, like, oh, the Natural Gallery, you know, like, and I think that when I got basically outside of D.C. or New York, I was like, oh, these aren't normal. <laughs> like, you don't just have them. Um, but I think being mm -hmm. in the pandemic and also like low key, I was, you know, recently in a museum show. And uh, so I got to kind of like tromp around the museum uh, and be like excited that, you know, like. 
just that, like, the weird freedom of those spaces that isn't quite... It's just weirdly unmonitored. The thing, the line that really got to me was, you're in a space that doesn't want your money when it shows you something. Like, we're all in spaces where we get to see stuff all the time. You know, like, oh, like a sign and a commercial and a TV show and a thing and a video game and blah. Like, we're stimulated with stuff. But all of these things have this little second consciousness where you're like, what does it want out of me? You know, like someone hands you something on the street. Your first thought is, what do you want in exchange, <laughs> right? Yeah. And just the fact that the museum, even the, is just people kind of expressing their thoughts and ideas in the form of art objects. And they don't really want anything from you. These people already got everything they could possibly get. They got in the museum, you know? Right. And just be, to be surrounded by objects which are people expressing something and they don't want anything out of you gets rid of that little second consciousness where you're like, ugh, like, but, but, but what? But why? And you can, it's almost the opposite of the way we're trained to think about art, which is that we look at an art object as being extra, extra smart and loaded with extra intention. It's almost like a pleasure that they have less intention than everything else um, in a certain, from a certain point of view. So, I, you know, I'm just excited to get back out there and, yeah. I don't know, see what it's like to appreciate things again. Well, I tell like us it. about that museum show you were in. What was that? Um, it was a, it was billed as like an expressionist portraiture cool. um, show, uh, but it was also kind of like, it was this one dude's collection basically. Um, and I say that because, like, it was an expressionist portraiture show, but, like, Basquiat wasn't in it. <laughs> and I was. So I was like, this isn't really a service, <laughs> nice. you know? But, but, he, was a, but he, was a, he was a wealthy enough collector that he does have a, a very impressive collection. So it was, like, it, had, it was at the Walker Museum in Minneapolis, and it was, like, Warhol wow. and Picasso. It was, and everyone in it was a millionaire or dead, except for me. Um, <laughs> and so it was... It, it was nice to see your work in that context, um, and it's yeah. nice to. It's also just fun to just sort of like talk to the curators of that kind of show, which is kind of um, historical. Like it had the walls are painted a certain color of brown and stuff, and it's like okay, like now my work is is you know can be seen as this kind of art, um, and. It was, it's also like the nice thing about museum shows, which is different than galleries, is you can lurk. Um, <laughs> so you can just kind of hang out in a room and you can watch like a family of four, like ignore three Picassos and then go, oh, look at this. And look at your painting. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, cool. You know? And always like the, you know, there's like the daughter with the green hair goes, oh, I love this. And then, you know, the mom goes, why? You know, and you're like, okay, that's, that's kind of what's supposed to be happening around these paintings. So, yeah. so good. But like, but you know, but I mean, yeah, I mean, that's probably a column in itself. It's like what it's like to be in a, in a big survey museum. Um, but it's hard to do, you know, there are certain decoder columns that are hard to write without like sounding like you're just bragging. It's like, I want people to know what this is like. It's a weird experience, but I don't just want to be like, hey, look at me, you know. Um, but the walk so. or something to uh, brag about, that's incredible. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it beats working for a living. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julie, what do you got on your plate? Right now, um, I'm really just looking forward to seeing so many shows over the summer. Um, I get the summers off, so I plan right. to do a lot of studio visits as well. So I'm hoping the summer is going to be more, maybe similar to Zach in a different way, but very experiential. And I'll come back refreshed in the fall. Um, I just want to... Oh, can, I ask, can I ask about studio visits? Yes, absolutely. Okay, because, I mean, I start off at studio visits like an artist. You know, so right. I think, oh, a studio visit. My apartment has to be full of art. And then I have to make sure the person sees all the art and that they like it. And then they do whatever they do with my art. Right. And I feel like to a reporter or to a cur curator, studio visit is a whole different thing. Um, so 
I don't know. How how do you? What's the point of a studio visit? How do you do one? Like, what 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 are you looking for? Like, to you, what's a studio visit? Well, one thing is I, I love to be in the space. I mean, I, I love to be in that kind of intimate space. And I always feel it's a real, you know, kind of special honor to be brought in. And I think also I, I'm very, I'm qu- kind of quiet. So I want to interact with the art and I, but I'm also, usually there's a lot of talking, <laughs> explaining what's going on and what I'm seeing. And, and um, so it's sort of these two spaces at once. So on the one hand, I feel... I want to sort of have a ghostly presence to let them talk as much as possible while I'm observing. And then, you know, also see things that just, I'm, I'm not able to see in the same way. I mean, seeing just like a huge um, breadth of art that like is in progress and, um, you know, and, and just what it looks like. Like my first, um, my first studio visit was just a year ago when I was going to Haley Barker's studio. And we spent a couple hours just talking about, you know, the postcards actually that she had above her workspace because, um, you know, I, I loved a particular one and we had a whole dialogue about that. And so I, I guess the purpose is really different. It's, um, you know, I'm always a little bit of a voyeur. So anytime anyone's going to let me do that is, is my, uh, my goal. <laughs> um, but feel safe to. Yeah. Really. I, yeah. I mean, as an artist, you just take all of that for granted. You're like, yeah, there's duct tape on the wall, you know, like, Right. You forget that you're letting someone in on a process that they're not used to. I had a, my worst studio visit ever was Carrie James Marshall. Oh. Um, he, I, he had been a teacher at uh, a, a Scout Keegan when I was there. And so he was like, oh, I'll come by and do a studio visit after. I was like, oh, this is great. And he brought his wife and she's a writer. <laughs> and she had this old book, like this beautiful hardbound book of plays. Um, and while, uh, Carrie James was in my apartment and he was like totally doing the thing that you described, Julie, which is like, he, there were some Polaroids I had on the wall, which were legit <laughs> just Polaroids of my friends. And, read away <laughs> right. and he was like, these are fascinating. These are like impressionist paintings. And I'm like, that's really just G young, like wearing green shorts. Like it's legit <laughs> just like my girlfriend <laughs> standing on steps, but okay. Um, but then his wife spilled water or something all over her book Oof. and so the whole it suddenly all became about like saving this book uh, because <laughs> oh my god carrie james had grown up his dad had owned a pawn shop when he was growing up in chicago and so he knew how to preserve a book after the pages had gotten <laughs> wet and i was like well, I mean, it's an anthology, right? Like, also, I was thinking, like, aren't you guys rich? Like, but, but she was like, no, this is a specific, you know, a specific edition of like of this of this book of plays. It, you know, it's like it's you know, it's an early 20th century collection. And so I was like, okay, so like, what you have to do to preserve like a damaged book, like, is you have to get a bunch of pieces of newspaper and you have to. Uh, or, or newsprint and get them wet and interleaf them through every page. And this book was like, you know, four inches thick. So the whole visit was just them in my horrible, like, Williamsburg kitchen, just like interleaving pages in between, like, death of a salesman. Oh <laughs> and I was like, that was my studio visit. And I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, God. But it's an anthology. <laughs> um, we're going to wrap I mean, it up in a little bit. Yeah. But, but we have a question from Danila. Am I Hi. saying that name yeah. properly? Thank you for bringing me up on the stage. Yeah, my name is Danila, and um, I'm an artist living in uh, New Mexico currently. I've lived all over, including California, albeit never L.A., although I'm heading down there in three days, so I'm excited. But I just couldn't help to come up and maybe have the opportunity to pose a question to Tulsa. I just feel like this is a unique opportunity. Um, Absolutely. I, I don't entirely mean to name drop. However, I do know I'm in friends with uh, Max King Cap, one of your writers. So I don't know if uh, everybody knows all, everyone in the team. But uh, mm-hmm. I've had the privilege of having him at my studio twice here. Um, and I'll actually have the double privilege of seeing him in LA go to the uh, museum together, so mm-hmm. I'm excited about that. But my question really is, so I've been uh, reading the paper since I've been, I've known, essentially since I've known him and reading foremost his articles and then others, and I'm just wondering, like, I really would love to 
here, Tulsa, I know it's been going for a while, like, has the mission of your journal changed over time, or do you feel like it stayed very consistent? I'm just, I'm really curious about aspect of journalism and, like, how it begins. You were talking a little bit about it, like, representing the L.A. scene, which had a booming, you know, market, but nobody was really seeing it, although that's certainly shifting now. So I'm just wondering, like, with that shift, have things change for you in terms of what your your mission is um you know i don't really think so i mean sometimes you have to uh you know try different strategies to make money i mean that is one thing that that is always a constant you have to make a certain amount of money and that and so you might change a few things like let's bring in uh this writer for this or uh or you know, I mean, just a little bit maybe that has to do with the business side of the magazine. But I really feel like uh, the mission to have accessible uh, reading, to really represent L.A. and um, try to really focus on uh, up-and-coming artists, but give respect to uh, veteran artists as, as well. I don't feel like my or the mission of the magazine has changed too much. I, you know, I don't know if you want me to elaborate any further on that, but I really feel like I'm, you know, like the intention of uh, artillery has kind of stayed intact. You know, I kind of still have the same principles about art. There's a lot of, uh, I do like to bring in new uh you know, new writers with fresh ideas. I do like that. Max King Cap is one, actually, so I'm glad you brought him in or up. So, you know, I would like to certainly diversify way more, so I'm kind of trying to work on that. But I've always had that, uh, I think, in, uh, in mind, too, already. So um, just, um, no. It, I don't think it has, unless maybe you think, if you said you've been reading it a lot. No, I feel like uh, the direction has always been kind of uh, the same. Accessible writing, keeping on top of things, making uh, the readership or readers, you know, aware of what's going on in the L.A. art world. No, yeah, that's great. Um, I couldn't say, I wasn't questioning whether I thought it had changed just because yeah. um, I, I don't have enough t uh, history and time reading journal over a sort of a longer period of time. But uh, I just, I guess, I think maybe you answered it in terms of like you wish potentially to diversify it much, but just from like what I've spoken with Max, and at least knowing what he likes to focus on, which is more the kind of unseen, underrepresented artists. And I think today, you know, that's definitely relevant. Like, there's a shift, what's happening in the art world, in the market, just, you know, trying to give more visibility to those who haven't had it. Um, and so I, I think that's great and important. So I didn't know if, like, perhaps it was leaning more in that direction or if it's always been that way. Or, well, I kind of feel always... I mean, I've always said, look, we don't need a review of, you know, Jeff Koons at Gagosian. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Right. We just don't. We, unless it, like, was something just so egregious and horrible, then let's, you know. But, I mean, and I do like to uh, discover people. Like, for instance, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not saying Emily Barker was under, under, undiscovered. She had this show and everything. But, you know, I was really glad that Julie brought up you know, Emily Barker. And so I like, I do like to have, yeah, let's write about this person. They don't, you know, I'm, I'm definitely into that. Definitely. And cool. uh, yeah. And I ask also my reviewers, Hey, let's quit going to the same galleries. Come on people. Let's go to these, uh, you know, nonprofits, alternative galleries. I'll, you know, that's where the real, uh, you know, energy is, from I feel like in uh, Los Angeles is uh, the new, you know. So I try to do that, and I, you know, I ask my writers, you know, please let's not new, do the, you know, just the obvious. So I do try that. So that is a what we try to keep doing. You have a reputation for that. That's artillery. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, Zach and Julie, anything we can maybe add to the conversation? I guess I said. Oh, one. there's there, there's definitely something. Okay. <laughs> Let Julie. You keep submitting articles about desire to Tulsa. Yes. What's your What's your dream article? Like you're like okay, <laughs> you're given like they're like research budget six months, twelve months. You can talk to whoever you want. You want to say something or find something out. What What would it be? Oof! Wow! Wow! That's such a good question. Um, it doesn't have to be the one. Like it won't be like someone listens to this and goes, "I have decided to give you the money." You know, just <laughs> like just give us one. You know, like something that's like a big. You know, an art like a. Christmas present, you know, like a yeah. Um, gosh, I, I mean, part of it is that I really so. I mean, I'm a fiction writer, and so what I would love to do is a collaborative piece with someone. I mean, interacting with work. Um, if I had six months, so maybe I don't have a particular artist in mind, but the idea of kind of putting uh, the the kind of writing and the kind of inquiry I do with the art itself would be really, really exciting. So I think that would be closer to my dream six month kind of stipend project. What would be the, okay. So is there an, a writer who you feel has, has done a good job of in any medium who's like written about fine art in their fiction or nonfiction in a way that was inspiring to you? Or would you be like, yeah, I'm the first person who's done this the way I was done? <laughs> I, would, I don't think I'm the first person, but, um, you know, I think anytime, I mean, I just love, and maybe it isn't about fine art specifically, but um, within a book when there's attention to, like, the sensuality of the um, you know, anything that's, that's bringing that into it, you know, language is, is limited. And that's partially why I, I want to go to galleries. The, you know, the visual arts is, um, it gives me a different, a different mode of expression, right. That isn't medium. Uh, but let's see, I, I read, um, Ali Smith's recent books, the, um, the quartets, like the seasonal quartets, and she isn't writing about fine art, but she is sort of writing about everything and the seasons. And in certain ways, it did feel, um, there is an artist character, but um, it felt she was writing a lot about um, the sensual world in a way that I was excited about. Um, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. I felt like at the end of, at, at the end of like the 19th century, there was this like weird thing where there were lots of magazines and writers and right. people who wanted to do journalism, but there was terrible reproduction for art. Yeah. And so there are these wonderful descriptions of paintings Yes, for people who can't go see them. Like you can't yeah. just get on it, you know? And so, and it was this brief moment because after a while it's like, oh, you can just look at it. And so like one of the most fun things to do to describe a work of art, we don't do anymore because you can just look, like you just go on the internet and look at it. And before yeah. that, even in art form, there were colors in the back. But there was this brief moment where you could like read Baudelaire describing a Cezanne, you know, yeah. and that's like yeah. a different picture because it's like an inventory of what he notices in what order. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, I do like, I feel like, I don't know if there needs to be a journalistic space for that, but I do think it's a wonderful space where you like, you're, you're getting a second consciousness in your head about the art in a way that isn't intrusive or judgmental. It's just somebody else, you know? Right, absolutely, and that's that's my background. So I, I love that I studied Russian literature in that period, and also French literature. So um, yeah, I, I love that. And okay. it was time. Well, right. Ju Julie, I've got to say you did a very good job of that with your uh, Jasmine uh, Diaz piece, trying oh, to describe that process. It was obviously difficult to do. So bravo. <laughs> yeah, it was, she has such a technical process too. Yeah, um, you know don't have the scientific mind for or the, <laughs> the the spatial intelligence perhaps even for but um but thank you yeah it was really really cool to have her walk me through it and she was very patient about it and it was also exciting because she showed me the way things would change in the light and you know illumined with her phone and it felt like you know like a mini lesson and i i'm <laughs> always, i'm always apt to be the student so um i'm fine with that i don't have any ego involved in it so <laughs> it was and it was really and that was all done with what FaceTime or something with your no, phone? 
Well, no, we had masks and we um, oh, we were okay. alone. We arranged to just meet on our own. So it was a really <laughs> kind of special moment because I had not been in a gallery and, you know, I, um, <laughs> we were there a long time. It was quite hot, actually, for some reason. It was a really humid day in winter because it's Los Angeles and I was just trying to... Um, not, you know, be sweating, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> <laughs> while, while she gave me so much of her time. <laughs> That's life in L.A., just trying not to sweat. <laughs> well, Tulsa, we kind of got to wrap it up a little bit, and I hate to do that because you're so much fun to be with. Any kind of last thoughts besides telling people well, to go I pick up the new know. issue? No, I... Well, all I can say is I feel, you know, immensely proud to have Zach and Julie talking, you know, and representing artillery. And uh, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> impressed. And um, no, I mean, um, I think we live in a very exciting uh, time right now. A lot of shit's going down. And, Absolutely. Um, I think the art uh, is going to reflect a lot of that. So I think that um, there's a lot of good things to come, you know? It is a good time to be alive. Yeah. Like Zach was saying, you know, it's, it's better rich or poor, but at least we're alive. So it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. Again, it's just a little bit more insight on a very valuable publication in Los Angeles. Um, I don't want Tulsa to make it sound so easy because I've seen the blood, sweat, and tears you've created in this amazing magazine, this long journey over, you know, 15 years is a long time. So yeah. congratulations. Well, thanks. And thank you. Keep, keep dancing. You know, and Zach... Thank you for showing up. I mean, you're just the best. And every, you know, if every issue you're doing something interesting and, again, bringing us into a, a world that is, is foreign to so many. So anything else we can add, Zach, before we say goodbye? I mean, if you let me talk, I'll just be talking. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like it when you talk. So... We'll we'll save that for some other time. And again, I, Julie, I, I, look I want I'm excited to read two of his like weird like hybrid art novel. So <laughs> I'm, you know, yeah, maybe like, that's, that's what I'm here for. Well, well daughter, that's coming up. My daughter then. gave me a deadline that um, it's at the end of summer, so you might you might be reading it sooner than you think. <laughs> Good, we'll be happy to <laughs> follow that. Let's get you a stipend too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. and I also have you know, I also want to bring back thinking about, once again, a 19th century thing. I really want to bring back these epistolary exchanges because in my conversations with Isabel, um, you know, that were through <laughs> messages on Instagram, we I noticed I was composing these long, long, long messages back to her in a way that I hadn't done in a really long time. And I, I you know, it's we were in the middle of the pandemic, you know, no one was seeing anyone, but... Um, I think, I think, yeah, in, you know, I would like to do maybe Tulsa someday or some in some space, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just like letters back and forth with with artists and, um, you know, in the ways that I loved, you know, reading uh, letters written by Cezanne or Van Gogh. Um, it's still really fun. And I think it's um, a nice space. It's an intimate space. Let's well, no. talk about that on Friday. OK. <laughs> okay. Julie, were you typing or were you were you writing by uh, hand? Was I writing by hand? Well, I haven't, I was too shy to ask her to mail things. And, um, you know, she's very quiet too. So I, I typed it, but I would okay. love, I would love nothing more than to send, you know, art with pressed flowers to, to everyone I secretly admire. <laughs> so. Well, you know, <laughs> typing and handwriting is a different process of right. thinking. So, right. huh. but I, I always write, handwrite my notes before anything goes on the computer. So every, oh, wow. Larry's handwritten first <laughs> right. Impressive. Yeah. Keep, keep you I, out of trouble I, that way well, it's the only way i can think i don't know I, I don't know how to think at a at a screen very well yeah if there's <laughs> time for one more absolutely anecdote, i used to i used to be an intern at art forum when i was in school oh and one of my jobs was to file all of the correspondence oh. so whenever there was an email from anyone you know, like a letter from an artist, I would photocopy it and take it home 
<laughs> so I have like copies of all the, of these like of years and years of correspondence with Art Forum, with Art Forum. and I have like one on my wall from William Volman, the writer, <laughs> ah. to Jack Pankowski. It was good talking with you on the phone the other day. I have tried to come up with something within the parameters of your request. As I mentioned, dead artists would have been easier for me since I am morally and intellectually dead myself. <laughs> but hopefully this will serve. <laughs> I actually had a good time writing it. It would be nice if you enjoyed reading it too. Hey, please find an essay and an invoice. Please call me when you get this since I will be back from Asia for a while. Yours truly, William T. Balbin. <laughs> wow. Zach, have you ever written about your time in art forum? Uh, not a whole thing um that i mean obvious and uh, here's the problem with stuff like that obviously is like well, that could be another call anything yeah. anything too interesting will get you in trouble you know um so i don't you know like i uh, you know nobody nobody raked me over the coals or anything um while i was there uh, and i think that there are actually people who've been through art form who have more important stories to tell than mine but uh but yeah like i it's not worth the trouble. You know, none of my stories are so good that, you know, they have, were so important that they had to be heard and are worth getting Tulsa in trouble or anybody else, you know? <laughs> right. It's just an office with a group of people. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a group of people who had, you know, were not all normal and had a lot of power, but, you know, that's, that's a, a private conversation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I just recently reread that section in uh, Seven Days in the Art World, and it just alluded to so many things that might have that she could have disclosed. <laughs> so it's pretty fun. It wasn't quite the Devil Wears product, like not at least yeah. for me. It was just you know well, I was happy to be employed because um, it was my school paid for the internship, which was wonderful. That's actually a great thing. Wow, um, Cooper yeah. Union. Would it was an art school, but they would pay you to take any internship. So you could literally just go to anyone in New York and go, "I want to work for you for free. The school will pay me," and they do it. Which is actually that's the that's the way to do an internship because well, it kind of makes that whole system fair, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's outrageous. Uh, but yeah, that's also wow. But yeah, it's nice having a job where no one cares if you do it. And you can show up late <laughs> and just get paid because your boss isn't there. Yes. <laughs> the person paying you is like, "Oh yeah, you did this, okay." Those glory days at Art Forum. Well, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. And I think we got a little more insight on artillery. And clearly, there's much more to learn. This is part of our Spotlight series, where we take a look at all of the amazing small publications, small and large, in America. And we feature all of that on artreporttoday.com. So, again, thanks, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Gordy. Thanks for uh, following Thank Gordy Hillary. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. You're good to get all to know right. all of you a little bit better, too. That's really great. <laughs> this has been a production of Art Report Today. Find your inspiration in the arts every day at artreporttoday.com. <laughs>